Please be advised that Gen X This Is Why contains adult language. Do not talk about that man ever again. Buck Rogers is coming back. Nope. Hi, and welcome to Gen X This Is Why, the podcast where we re-examine the sometimes bizarre and often scarring media from our shared childhood. My name is Amy, and I'm a proud Gen Xer, born in 1977. And I'm her sister, Jenny, born in 1974. Jen, I think I fixed my mic issues. Thank God, because you sounded <laughs> like you were like in an echo chamber in the last episode. It was terrible. Guys, I was an idiot. I'm like, oh, let me put my mic down lower on my keyboard tray. So then I was essentially talking into the wall, and it was echoing back onto the microphone. I didn't know you did that. You didn't tell me you were doing that. Yeah, I did. I'm an idiot. I have to have this huge microphone right in front of my face, apparently. What what do you think recording is? (laughs) Like, that's literally what you have to do. I guess. I guess. Um, Jenny, I have an announcement. Okay. As many of you know, we have crossed the bridge into Amy's Variety Hour. So, I'm still flirting with what that's going to look like, but you can look for your first one in September, I'm thinking. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, second is if you like reality TV. <laughs> <laughs> this I, re- I I just want to say I reluctantly agreed to do this. No, 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 no. You did not you this is about my crossover. It has nothing to do with you. Oh, I thought it had to do with Rock of Love. No the reality we are, TV that we're guys, covering. On Patreon. Why would you, you promote the stuff that we're doing? Sorry. <laughs> You guys have come for us on Patreon. We're up to like 105, 106. (laughs) We love it. We really enjoy covering Rock of Love. That is not going away. Neither is my so-called life. We're going to finish those fuckers out. So if you haven't joined already, just click the link. Or as the kids say, smash that link. Is that what they say? That's what the kids say. Smash the like button. Smash the link. I always thought smash meant to fuck. I don't know. Wow. Okay. (laughs) And you taught college? Uh Uh-oh. Okay. Anyway, if you like Married at First Sight, I host a podcast called Six Degrees of Reality TV with my friend Leslie DJ. We cover Married at First Sight. We had a crossover with reality gays, Jake and Matt, and it was so much fun. Those two are so great. I love them so much. If you haven't checked out Reality Gays and you like like 90 Day Fiance and stuff like that, give them a listen. They're really great. I feel like us promoting reality gays is like, like, I mean, they're so much more successful than us. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I know. If we can send our 12 listeners over to reality gays, I'm just saying if you want to hear me in a different context. If you want to hear Amy when she's not restricted to like all the, all the constraints I put her under for this podcast. And I hear Amy in her natural environment. And I'm actually talking to somebody who wants to be there. (laughs) I'm planning all these crossovers for Jenny and me, and Jenny's just like, yeah, you could do that. Yeah, you could do that. (laughs) She doesn't even want to talk to anybody else. (laughs) All right. So, Jenny, today we're looking at Little House on the Prairie, Season 8, Episode 14, The Legacy. Do we have a description? We do. The description is, a present-day couple buys an antique table with a large I branded on it and are curious to learn about its origins. The story focuses on Charles' efforts to patent the table and have it mass-produced. Mm, that's not what that's about. Erroneous on all counts. It's a C and an I branded into it, yes. not just an I. Yep. And Charles doesn't want to mass-produce it. No, Charles, that's wrong. It's fucked by mass-producing. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing gets fucked. All right, Jen, we open on what Timmy says is either 1969 or 1970 Ford pickup. Is he just always lurking in the background? (laughs) He was sitting in his chair watching his YouTube videos about how to install solar on our house. And I'm like, look at the the TV. What kind of truck is that? Look at the TV. And he can just tell from the headlights. It's amazing. Well, you know, like, you mean the chair that you now faced away from the TV? (laughs) Amy so rearranged open. her living room. <laughs> and she, like the chair Timmy always sits in is like now with its back to the TV. <laughs> he doesn't watch TV really. <laughs> if we're watching something, it's in, in either in the bedroom or downstairs in the winter. We save all our shows for the winter. Because we're weirdos. 
Amy, he was taking up valuable real estate from the TV, <laughs> so she moved him. <laughs> well, now I notice um, an unintended consequence of that is I can't watch anything on a louder volume because it's like right in his ear. <laughs> oh, God. So, but don't you watch everything with closed captions anyway? I do, I do. By the way, I'm watching Indian Matchmaker. Do you watch that? No, is it good? You would, you would really love it because it's very, very well produced and. It's really like a nuanced look at Indian culture. Like, I really enjoy it. It's really well done. And season two is out now. And all I'm going to say is I'm enraged. I'm enraged because one of our sweethearts gets really burned. And Uh my mouth was agape. I was like, what? I was freaking out. So there's that. Okay. I'm watching um, Instant Dream Home. Have you seen this? It's on my list. It's crazy. It's okay. crazy. They leave for like a day, right? And they, they redo have 12 their house? hours. They redo a house in 12 hours. You should have Timmy watching this because I feel like he okay. doesn't have to say about this. All right. Maybe Timmy and I will cover that on Amy's Friday. <laughs> anyway, um, this is <laughs> Tara's and directed by Michael Landon. He's back in the director's chair. Okay, I have to say something. Wait, who's the writer? Vince Gutierrez. Okay, so he also wrote The Blind School episode where the robbers keep them hostage okay and he wrote one more dark sage with caleb ledoux okay and i feel like he's not a bad writer he's not terrible no this wasn't terrible this wasn't that terrible and then i realized (laughs) it wasn't terrible because we were seeing charles in peril again oh god he's always in some kind of like existential crisis so we open on this this ford pickup with a really sweaty couple going antique hunting and do you call it antique hunting? Like, I know. What do you mean I just call it antiquing? Whatever. All right. I don't know. Who said antique hunting? Okay. So they're attending an auction. And in this auction, we see a table made by Charles being auctioned off. It has the initial CI branded into it. Now, side note, side note, I had a table just like this. Okay. In your dollhouse? You had a table like this in your dollhouse. I did in my dollhouse, but I also did in my (laughs) real house. (laughs) But it didn't have a CI on it, unfortunately. (laughs) And it was more rounded, but it had those two drop leaves. Yeah, I mean, that's a common style. One of them was broken, so I just put it up against a wall all the time. There you go. We don't know where it went, but I liked that table. Now we cut back in time to Charles loading this table into a onto a wagon and then into a store to sell it. The store owner, Sven, says he will buy anything Charles makes. I, I hear you, Sven. I'm with you. Okay. So Charles says, well, I just do this for a hobby. And then there's some rando there, Jack, who has a tingling arm. And I'm like, he's going to be dead. He's like the red shirt on Little House. He's going to be dead. <laughs> so they're talking about getting old. And Charles is like, I'm not old, dude. And now they're they're like leaving. So they they he picks this rando up in this town and they're heading back. So they're in the wagon having Did this he pick him up in the town? I thought he came with them. Maybe he did. Who knows? But they're okay. on they're in a wagon on their way home, is my point. Yes. Jack says he's pushing 60, and I just wrote, How dare you imply that Charles is old? Charles is in the prime of his life. How old is he? Is he in his forties at this point? This okay, do you want to hear how old this actor is? Jack? 37. <laughs> uh, just for just for um, continuity, remind everyone how old you are. Okay, I'm 48. In case He's you couldn't 49. do the math at the He's beginning. He's 49. <laughs> oh my God. In case you couldn't do the math at the beginning of the episode, I'm 48. 49, Jenny. Wow. This is like wow. when you realized Brett Michael was your age well, and I you mean, needed a minute. <laughs> to be fair, they casted him as a 60-year-old. So I don't know what they casted him as because he only says he's pushing 60 and you know how people talked then he could be 50 depending on when his birthday is in that year. He could have been 50. We know how old he is because I don't want to give a spoiler, but we find out how old he was. (laughs) Yes, we do. All right. So they stop and they make camp and it's raining and thundering and Jack is getting all philosophical. He says he wants to do something different, something important, like leaving his stamp on the world. Oh, how how on the nose, Michael Landon, can he get? God. 
And Charles is like, do you want to be famous? And Charles starts laughing. And I have to say something. Michael Landon has an amazing laugh. Oh, my God. Here we go. It's hearty. It's from the gut. Like, it's a good laugh. The conversation that Jack and and Landon are having, like, it feels like they're stoned at, like, art school. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. Jack says, you get married, you build a house, you have kids, you farm, you freight. The kids grow up and move away, and suddenly you're facing the idea that you never did anything for yourself. Um, welcome to parenting. Yeah, what did he think it was going to be? Jesus Christ. <laughs> And he's like, you never do anything you'll be remembered by. And I'm screaming at the TV, what about your children? What about your children? They'll forget in a generation. (sighs) So Jack says he wants people to know Jack Preston once walked this earth and there's something left behind to remind them. And Charles is just like, sleep it off, dude. Good night. Like, I'm done. When are you coming down? But um, (laughs) he... I feel like social media has taken care of this problem because everybody's life is preserved for all time on servers. Don't look at me. I wrote a memoir, so my life's preserved. Boom, done. So now, Jen, in the middle of the night, Jack jumps awake because he's clearly having a heart attack, and Charles ignored that warning sign. Oh, because he's holding his tingly arm? And Charles like the whole ride. Wait, Charles is screaming at him to lie down. But the dude's like gasping for air. <laughs> this and death like scene was ridiculous. Around. Oh my god, it's so bad. He finally stumbles into a nearby pond and dies. And then Jen cut to his funeral. Cut to his funeral. <laughs> oh my god. So now we see. All right, the funeral's over, and now we see Jack's house, and he has two dick bag kids. Yes. These kids, oh my God, they're yelling at their mother. To sell their to sell her house. Yeah. She wants to stay in the house that Jack built her, but these asshole kids want to sell it out from under her because they're entitled to a piece of this too. Oh boy. Okay, dude, what are you going to get? $50? Well, what did they do? They got born. That's what they did. That's what they did. (laughs) So, um, and then I wrote, Jenny, that I almost wrote something about your parents paying for your life, but I forgot back then kids were just helpers. Yeah. They weren't like, like these kids probably did work their balls off. They were staff. (laughs) They were staff. (laughs) So knock on the door. It's Charles. Thank God he's here to save the day. Oh, God. Now he has, are they chisel markers? What? The chisel tools? What is they're, he returning? They're like, they're, they're woodworking tools, like to carve wood. They're like awls and like chisels and like. Mm, look at you, awls. Awls. What's an awl? It's like a pointy tool that you knock on to like carve wood. Okay, whatever. So Jack had loaned him these tools and the mom is like, just keep them, but do me a favor, put them to good use. Jack would want that for you. Well, cause you like, well, but they say something important. They say something interesting here. She's like, yeah, he bought them. Like always wanted to do something with them, but like never did like, you know, like the project yep. starter. And like, so like Jack's sitting there like crying about like, I never did anything to be remembered. Yet it sounded like he never really did want to do anything. <laughs> like you can't have it both ways, dude. Yeah. Yep. A hundred percent. So Charles is like, look, I want to give him a real grave marker. Like I want to do this upright because I owe him that much. Cause they're such good friends. Even though we've never met. We've this never seen before. this guy before. Nope. Yep. So Charles is like, I have to go. And you could tell the mother wants Charles to stay. I mean, I don't blame her. But she's like, can I offer you some some drink? Can I coffee. offer you some coffee? Can I offer you some uh, cookies? Can I offer you some sex? Like, she's just trying to get him to stay. <laughs> and he's like, I gotta go, I gotta go. <laughs> so then he leaves, Jen, and he's eavesdropping. He's eavesdropping. I love this scene! <laughs> I love him eavesdropping. I thought he was gonna bust back in there, but he didn't. He just <sighs> took it all in. He Not knows his, his business. Place. So the son is threatening to sue the mother. He's going to lawyer sue up. The mother. These kids are going to lawyer up. <laughs> Unbelievable. Jenny, if my kids try to lawyer up. If they up, ever I lawyer die, up. Punch them in the face. Oh sabotage them in some way. I will over lawyer up if they lo- <laughs> will. Have, we'll have an arms race of lawyering up. <laughs> 
All right. So Charles is now home and he's in the drama barn and he's carving the cross or grave marker, whatever it is. It is beautiful. It's really elaborate. It's really crazy. Supposedly he did this in three days. And also like, why are you going to put this much effort into wood grave marker? Okay. As somebody who has outdoor space in New York City, I could tell you what wood looks like after one season of being outside. It's like, it's 150 uh-huh. years old. Like that was brand new. And now it's 150 years old, like three I months later. I thought the same thing. Like there's not, he can't slap shellac on this to protect Well, also it. it has to be like, like it has to be a regional wood. It's not like teak or something. Yeah. So like, it's going to be destroyed in like five minutes. Who cares? We're never going to see this again. <laughs> no. no, but there is a date on it. Did you catch that? Yes. What is the date, Jenny? At first, I thought it was 1855, and I was like, what? 1833. Yeah. To 1885. 85. So we have we know what year it is now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's we still somehow stamp. the mid-80s. We have a time stamp. Mm-hmm. Oh, I want to go back to 1876 when he's, like, falling out of that tree, ribs all bandaged up. Anyway, he the dude was 52. How's that pushing 60? That is not pushing 60 people. I, this is how people talk. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> Carolyn comes out and he tells Carolyn, you know, when you when people die, you usually feel helpless. I don't remember him making a cross this fancy for his dead son. No, he did not. No, he did not. But he feels now like he's helping in some way because Jack was a really good friend to him. And Carolyn what? like lays one on him. She's all hot by this wood carving and then I looked at Timmy and I said Timmy because Timmy has thought about when he retires maybe making furniture I'm like you could be Charles Ingalls there you go you could start making tables and branding your initials into them TNA okay (laughs) (laughs) now Charles is at the grave and he installs the marker we have the time stamp Charles heads out to get the widow and he finds a completely new family there like family swap yeah Yep. Who, like Jenny, just do you wish them. you had this closing agent when you bought your house? I know, right? Like, <laughs> damn. This, it took me like six months. Guys, this go took back like eight to, minutes. Go back to season four when Jenny was buying her house. <laughs> season four, five, and six. <laughs> I, I was like, season four? I feel like it was like three different seasons. So in three days, this family has not only purchased this house, but has moved, moved in. in yep. And his other families moved out. Guys, have you ever moved an entire house? You can't do it in three days. No, Although I could. I could picture that dick bag son just throwing everything out. Dad yeah, he put it all. He put it all out on the curb. And I feel like in these days, people would just come and get all the stuff and take it away. Oh yeah, yep. This affects Charles, Jen. He's really affected by this. He has an existential crisis. He does, and he says, or he thinks it's like Jack has been wiped off the face of the earth. And then we get some Charles deep thinking footage. Did you see this? I like how he's just like, he has all this existential dread and he's talking about it. And like Carol, like he doesn't say anything to like Carolyn about like, like, like he doesn't have a conversation with her. Like, how do you reconcile this? Or how do you think about this? Like, no, because women are allowed to think about that. Right. Like her life just doesn't matter. Like Mm -mm. it just absolutely doesn't matter. Women, we're too busy raising the kids and taking care of shit. Yep. So that night, Charles is in the drama barn and Carolyn comes out. He's thinking. And I literally wrote, he doesn't ask her about her life because women don't have time to think. Yep. Char- Charles tells Carolyn, it was only two weeks ago when Jack was trying to tell me his thoughts. It's like he sensed that it would turn out this way. It's like that tingling in his arm. He just knew something was coming. Now he knew it would turn out this way because his kids are dick bags. Yep. And, and that's his fault. <laughs> He says his kids sold everything he owned and there was nothing left. And Charles starts to cry. And he says he doesn't want this to be him. And I wrote real big, your children are your legacy, douchebag. Your right. children are your legacy. I, and well, and that like literally happened. Yes. To Charles Ingalls. Yes. Not to Michael Landon. He was his own legacy. Correct. All right. So Charles heads into the city again to see Sven. And Sven shows Charles the he sold his table, Jen, for $12.50. Wow. Do we have a conversion is, on that? It's like 300 bucks, which is like not that expensive for a table. I mean, it's like average, but it's not like it's some wild, exquisite piece of furniture. Okay, I'm going to put in the Mimi Bees that Timmy made me an amazing coffee table. Okay. 
and I'm going to put it in there and see if anyone wants to buy it for $350. <laughs> okay. Now you're using it as your personal, like, like money making. Marketplace. <laughs> so Charles says he'll make another one once he gets home. And Sven was like, mm, I'm hoping you'd make 10 more. And then he offers to move Charles and his family there, which I don't know where they are. Are they in Minneapolis? Minneapolis. Yeah. To have him cranking out tables and other pieces in the back storage room and the Ingalls name will be everywhere. And Charles so is like, ooh, I like Basically that. what happens is Charles, this guy offers to be Charles' beneficiary, which was yeah. a thing that like artists got back in the day. Like, yes. dude, take advantage like of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Huge. Just like you guys are our patrons for our art. Do you see where that name came from now, Amy? <laughs> wow, Amy just had a light bulb go on. I like literally just saw a light bulb like light up over her head. Well, Patreon, the platform actually started for artists. Yeah. So it, yeah. you know, now we're including podcasts in there. I don't uh, know if they're a form okay. of art, but uh, Amy's yeah. variety hour might be. So Jenny at home, Charles is trying to talk Carolyn into moving to Minneapolis. And she's like, why would you give up everything you worked for? Like, go, she's like, Charles, go back and watch season two. We struggled, (laughs) we worked our asses off to build this life. What are you doing? He's like, this is a once in a lifetime chance. She's like, you're a farmer, not an artist, basically. Well, and she's like, you're a farmer. And she does say something like, she's like, our life used to be good enough for you. And that hit home. I was like, ooh, poor thing. Okay. So he says, I'm willing to give all this up if it means something happened to me, my asshole kids wouldn't get rid of all my shit, right? Carolyn goes, okay, so this is about Jack, isn't it? Um, you you think? think? Jack was a good man, but he was no Charles Ingalls. Because if he were, his kids would not have been able to do what they did. If it's a legacy you're after, Charles Ingalls, you can't do any better than our kids. No, I'm with Carolyn. Like, Jack got what he got because he, like, didn't put the time and effort into his kids, it seems like. Right. It sounds like he was a shitty father. I don't know. You don't don't just have shitty kids. Right. They come from somewhere. Well, and you don't just have good kids either. They come from somewhere. Right. They are born, like, like, just piles of clay. For you to mold and shape. Oh, However boy. that turns yeah. out. Is that, how's that turn out? <laughs> oh, I'm taking my kids school shopping today with mom. I want to With mom. mom. <laughs> I'm bringing mom to be the mediator. Okay. Because I don't do well. You know I hate shopping. You hate shopping to begin okay. with. Okay. Number one, I hate shopping. Number two, I hate spending money. Now I'm going to be doing both. See, this would kids. be a situation where I would excel. No. Because I love shopping. I love spending money. No, no. Uh, You know my Venmo. Send me some money. I'll spend it for you. Okay. Charles says he feels really strongly about this and like he needs to try, even if my reasons are wrong. No, dude. No. No. Why can't you just continue? If you love, this is like the dad with the art conversation. If you love crafting the furniture, if that's what you love doing, just do it. Just do it to do do it because you love it. We, you, know? you know who we've had this conversation with. I said, this is like dad. Yeah. <laughs> like, just do it because you love it. it. That's all. So. The, the conversion on the table, it's $312.50. Okay. Which is like a Wayfair table. It's not like you're buying this from like mm. Design Within Reach or something. True. Although I'd never pay $300 for a table. Oh my God. <laughs> So he says he will go alone for three months and see if it works out. And I just wrote, he has no regard for her or her security. And of course no. she's going to be supportive. Well, and then he's like, we'll get a handyman. I was like, oh, a handyman. Now Carolyn's no, on board. No, no. Do not talk about that man ever again. Buck Rogers is coming back. Nope, 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 nope. Spreading, spreading his crabs all over the... Ew. What, 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 was, what did she get from him? Was it chlamydia? Oh, it could have been any of those things. Gonorrhea, chlamydia, he's herpes, spreading crabs. his STDs all over the place. <laughs> So in Minneapolis, Charles and a few workers are cranking out tables and he's sending home a letter saying how great everything is and he's going to be able to send more money. Now, Carolyn, cut to Carolyn at the little house. She's reading this letter to all the kids, all 87 of them. Mm -hmm. And 
they're all against moving. Like, they don't like this. They don't want to go to Minneapolis. I don't get it because, like, Albert's like, oh, yeah, I've been there. Like, he's Albert's like, like, I fleeced that town. I'm wanted there. I can't go back. <laughs> Albert, you know that you love the city. Like you're gonna go back to hustling. But he's like, he's like, I like my quiet, like farmer life. I don't want to go back to like being a hustler. Don't forget, we have dubbed Albert the fuck boy. He wants <laughs> no. to go back to that city. No, what are you talking about? <laughs> I asked you last episode who would be a fuck boy, and you said probably Albert. That, that's the closest of this group. <laughs> but I wouldn't say that. Oh my god, this is disgusting and ridiculous. These people are children. (laughs) Okay. So, Carolyn's reading the letter, blah, blah, blah. Suddenly, this rando shows up. Total rando. Total rando. Uriah Cooper, who has the same name as James and Cassandra, and they point that out, but nothing ever happens. I thought that was their uncle at first. (sighs) Me too, because we know he comes back. And he looks like him. He's dressed like a 1980s television executive or an extra from Home Alone. No, he's dressed like, like Wimpy. No, not that Wimpy, the actual Wimpy. Oh, the actual Wimpy? Like the cartoon character? Yeah, I don't know how many times this cartoon character is going to come up in this podcast. <laughs> Um, like I, I don't like I have a vague recollection of this cartoon character, and yet like we can't stop referencing it. So we need wimpy merch. And Wait, you I got gotta the, find. I you have got to look the, at this. Hold on, character. you got the red light from Amber that you are able to use her her art of Hey Everybody. Hey, everybody. Now I know that that is is his name Dean Butler. Yeah, I know that's his likeness, and we'll get in trouble for using it. But is he really going to, does he have the money to sue us? I mean, we're making him more popular than ever. Yeah, Yeah, Abe, type wimpy cartoon. (laughs) Okay, hold on. (laughs) Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. Hold on. Wimpy cartoon? Yeah. Oh, you're right. Right? (laughs) You're right. Okay. It's like, it's like a suit, but hobo-y. Like it's got a hobo-ness to it. A hobo-ness. Yes, you're 100 percent right the guy looks like him i'm telling you i don't know how many okay. times we have to reference this cartoon character <laughs> but i can't call him wimpy because we already have a wimpy whatever so i'm just gonna call him rando wimpy all right so rando wimpy shows up and he's gonna work the farm and everyone's like eh, i don't know about this but carolyn's like yeah we'll hire you albert right. is totally sus He's like, I know this guy's game. And I would trust Albert. Yeah, 100%. In Minnesota, some (laughs) Willy Wonka dude, Addison Fisk, is admiring the tables. And there's a wait list, but Fisk is like, "Uh, can I pay you double to get on the top of this list? Don't trust businessmen. (laughs) Sven immediately abandons all of his morals and says, of course, come on inside, I'll write you up. At the Ingalls, Rando Wimpy is eating Carolyn out of house and home and not doing his work. He literally takes an entire basket of apples to bed That's with ridiculous. him. ridiculous. Jenny, what would your stomach be like if you ate an oh, entire God. basket be of dead. apples? I would be dead. Apples don't. I mean, if I eat an actual apple, this is fascinating. If I eat an actual apple, like I'm usually okay. But like if I drink apple juice, it destroys mm. me. Mm. Like my stomach's wrecked. Um, apple cider wrecks me. Yeah, me too. Yep. Any of that yeah. stuff. Yep. But I can drink alcoholic cider. Like, there's no problem. Well, it's funny because I used to not be able to, but I think a lot of them are like blended now and they're not all apple yeah. and like it, it's, it seems to be okay. Yeah. Albert also says, uh, by the way, Ma, Paul's going to have to redo all this guy's work because he sucks. <laughs> and Carol's like, wah, wah. It's like, just so fire this we- guy. <laughs> Now we see Charles burning the midnight oil and Sven comes in and he's like, we need to expand more space, more men. Charles says, what if we start up a night shift? And Sven's like, you're already here 12 hours a day. Well, what I forgot is that they have to use all manual tools at this time. Yes. Yeah. So Charles says, just give me a cot in the corner and I'll sleep whenever I can. Jenny. What? Would you like to try to sleep in a working factory? <laughs> no, no, of course not. I feel like sometimes it feels that way in Brooklyn. 
at the little house, Albert can't sleep. He's up. He is distraught. He's just sitting at the table, like brooding. He sit. Did you catch what he was doing? No. Okay, no one else can see this, but he was doing this. <gasps> Twiddling his fingers. Which is what Graham used to do, twiddling her thumbs. Okay, all right. She would do it constantly. Mom just told me the most bizarre story about Graham. Graham used to say that only she felt bad for only children, and you shouldn't have just one child, because if that child died, you wouldn't have another. So, like, you're just the backup kid? That's yes. what that's implying. Yes. You're like, like and, holy wait, shit. and she said this to mom, who is the backup kid. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, mom, she said the quiet part out loud. <laughs> <laughs> she said to you, mom, that you were the backup kid in case something happened to Uncle Bobby. Wow. Wow. Okay. I wonder why so... younger siblings are fucked up. <laughs> They're just like a replacement in case. Albert is really bothered by Randall Wimpy. He's like, I don't know what's happening. I don't like the guy. I don't trust him. And he's like, look, between me and James, we can handle things. Let's fire this dude. And Carolyn's like, you know what? You're the man of the house. Do as you see fish. Albert's so excited. He gets to fire mm-hmm. this guy. Yep. So the next day, Albert swings by the field and this fucking asshole Who? is just sleeping by a tree. Rando Who? Wimpy. Rando, it's Albert Rando the Wimpy. boss. Uh, it's oh, no offense, Albert. No, it's Albert the boss. No offense, Albert. No offense, Albert. <laughs> Albert the boss swings by the field. This dude's sleeping by a tree. Albert fires him. And I have to admit, it was kind of hot. Oh, God. He was like, get the fuck out of here, dude. <laughs> Goodbye. I was like, wow, he's like a little Charles. Okay. Okay, so he put he puts up a fight, but Albert is literally like, fuck you, dude. We don't even know you squatter rights. Get the yeah, fuck out of get here. Get out of here. So unfriendly Willy Wonka, as I'm calling this businessman, gets his table, and guess what, Jen? He is stealing the design. Yep. Because he owns a furniture factory. Yep. And he's going to start mass producing. Now, he doesn't only have hand tools. They have some stuff. They don't have electric tools, though. No, but it looks like it's more robust than what Charles was working with over there. In what way? <laughs> There's <some> noises. <laughs> like, I hear saws. <laughs> I knew there was nothing that you could base it on. I was it's wondering what fa- you were It is a factory. Oh, is well, what not? was... Well, what was Charles thing? I mean, they had two shifts of people. They like, how the fucking room? So, no, so the building has to do with if it's a factory. Well, or not. what? So, what do you think is the difference? He just has 150 people working for him versus oh, maybe. 15. Maybe okay. So at Sven's, he's noticing a downtick on his orders, even some cancellations, which is pretty weird. And they have to fire the night shift guys already. Those poor fuckers. They had a job for like a week. And Sven is getting nervous. Now, Charles is reading a letter from Carolyn. And she's like, we had to fire the farmhand. He was a piece of shit. Don't worry about it. Glad glad your experiment out there is going poorly and you're slowing down. Love you. Bye. (laughs) As he's reading the letter and walking through town, he spots his table and finds out it's mass produced. For four ninety five. Dun dun dun. So what is that, Jen? A hundred, hundred bucks? Because it's like cut by a third, right? Almost. It's twenty five dollars per dollar. So it's like a hundred bucks. Okay. So you had to see my eyes when Jenny said that to me. I was like, Oh my god, I have no idea how to even start this equation. Oh my god. Uh, all right, Charles goes to East Furniture and he confronts unfriendly Willy Wonka. And Charles is like, I'm going to take you to court. And Willy Wonka's like, go ahead. I'll drag it on for a long time. Oh, oh, oh. Like, just give this dude a menacing laugh and boom, you're done. I have an index card. Please let it be on patent laws and shit. It is. Does Charles have a case? I think he does. Did Charles have the opportunity to apply for a patent? So, like, was that a thing at this time? So, as we've discussed many times on the pod, lawyering up is like goes back to ancient times. <laughs> like, it's some we've been litigious for like mm-hmm. hundred, a thousands time. of years. <laughs> like, it's like the, one of our oldest customs. 
The oldest form of patent was seen in medieval times. Medieval rulers would grant rights to, quote, a monopoly. So, like, they literally mm-hmm. granted you the right to, like, have a monopoly. Mm-hmm. That was more... That was more based on, like, you controlled the purchasing and money and economy around this thing. It later became about your artistic creation, your your scientific or artistic creation. That that was, and, it, and it has to be um, practical art. I forget the term they use. It's not practical, but something like that. Okay. The earliest such right to own your invention or design was granted in the colonies in the state of Massachusetts, in what would become the state of Massachusetts in 1641. The Massachusetts General Court gave Samuel Wilson the right, Winslow, Samuel Winslow, the exclusive right to utilize a new process for making salts for 10 years. So patents also expire. And that's why you get like something that's a a name brand drug and no one else can make a, no one can make a um, generic of it for like 10 years. That's where you get that from. Yes. Yes. The U.S. Constitution which was adopted on September 17, 1787, in case you weren't sure, had a provision for protecting inter- intellectual rights. The provision is found in Article 1, Section 8. The Congress shall have power to promote the progress of science in useful arts. That's what they use, useful arts. Okay. All right. By useful. securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights to their writings and discoveries. The Patent Act of 1790 allowed 14 years for you allowed for you to own the patent for 14 years however in the 1890 depression which we're not in yet right it's 1885 correct yes resulted in an unfavorable view of patents and resulted in courts ruling unfavorably to patent owners so at this time progress u.s capitalism like yeah 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 they they liked patents like they want you know because companies want to own patents and own monopoly so like Charles probably would have had a case, but I think, I think also so. he definitely would have had a case. But also, like, I think at this time, because I'm, I'm more familiar with copyright laws, which are mm-hmm. the unuseful arts, right? Which, by the way, bitches, Gen X, this is why it's copyrighted. It's trademarked. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you had to actually file the patent, though, which Charles probably has not done, but maybe spend oh, it. Oh, Maybe. Because yeah, like if they, it. I know the way copyright works is you used to have to file your copyright. Mm-hmm. This was like in the eighties, I think. And if you didn't, you were screwed. And if you didn't, you were screwed. Now you automatically own it. But if you don't file it, then you're responsible for all of the court costs going mm-hmm. after the person, but you technically own it. You don't have to file it. Guys, if go fu- listen to our Cabbage Patch Kid episode if you want to know oh, right. more about this. Yes. So you have like, but if you file it, then the government goes after them. For copyright right. infringement. Mm-hmm. And you don't like, so I don't know. I don't think patent works that way though. I think you still have to pay. So Charles, basically in this day, you would have to pay for really expensive lawyers to do this. And like, Charles just doesn't have that. That's not no. a thing. So, and, and I feel like Wonka does. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and he says that. He's like, yeah. I'll just lawyer up like insanely and drag you through court for I like- mean, dude's wearing a top hat. Dude is wearing he's a top lucky. hat. Don't <laughs> fuck with a dude wearing a top hat. No, he has Gen X pro tip. <laughs> Don't challenge a dude wearing a top hat he's to a l- lawyer off. He's literally the Monopoly guy. <laughs> yes, he is. All right, Jenny, can we move on from this? Yes, we can. Because something exciting happens next. So, so Charles, of course it does. <laughs> Charles takes things into his own hands. But Charles definitely has a case, but does he have... The means to execute the case? Probably not. Probably not. If only he knew a lawyer like his son-in-law. Oh, that's right. Jesus Christ, that useless piece of shit. Where is he? Isn't he dead? (laughs) Adam! (laughs) Adam is not dead. Oh, John Jr. died. The the reports of Adam Kendall's death have been exaggerated. Uh, It's John Jr. that died. I forgot. Okay. Dude is like, you had a good run. You made some money. Now it's my turn. Business is business. Yeah, fuck Charles off. runs out. He grabs an axe and he starts smashing <laughs> shit. And I'm all about this. And then guess what, Jen? He gets the shit kicked out of him again. Of course he does. He loves to does. fight like four guys. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so they're nursing their wounds and Sven offers Charles a drink. And of course, no thank you. Right. So... 
their Sven's like machines are terrible and blah blah blah. And Paul's like, this all started because I wanted to be remembered with my initials on some piece of furniture. And he starts cackling like this is hilarious. And then he's like, I forgot it's my kids who are at home missing me. Who, That's my who I've left for three months for this. Right. Then, Jenny, in one of my favorite scenes of all time, Carolyn is just innocently making the bed. And he sneaks up behind her. She turns around and she almost drops drawers for him right away. Oh She's my like, God. oh my God, Charles! And she throws herself around him. So he's home. And then she tells him, guess what? Albert and James have been doing all the fucking work around here. That's right. As per usual. Yep. So he surprises them up in the field and he hugs The carrot them. field. He's in the carrot. They're in the carrot field. Okay. Is that supposed to mean something? I don't know. Like, you know how like, there's all those, like, casual farm games? Yes. Yes. And you're like, you have a care field. Casual. That's like a real thing. Nothing is casual about Harvest Moon. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Cut to the future, and the couple wins the table for 125 bucks. They ask about the carpenter's mark, and the auctioneer has no idea. That's it. End of episode. They drive off. Yep. Jenny, whose fault is this? This is Charles's fault. Or like just getting too big for his bridges. <laughs> yeah, I don't just calm down, dude. Just calm down. Like, well, there was a lot of in between here. He could have just said, "Okay, Sven, like I'm gonna work on this stuff at home in my workshop in my time, and I'll just bring anything I make to you." Done. Yes. Like, and you can. You have two sons. Why not teach them how to do this? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So Jenny, I have this is Sven's fault. He let that fucker cut the line, and this is all a result of cutting the line. Cutting the line is a thing, guys. You don't cut the line. Wow. Okay. And Sven let that fucker cut the line. He let him pay to cut the line. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sven, you greedy bastard. My whole thing, my I mean, maybe this is Sven's fault. You're right. Because he should know his competition. He should know who this guy is. Oh, yeah. How does he not know? Yes. Good point. Good point. I always know your competition. It's, it's like if you have a mom and pop store and Mr. Walmart walks in. Yeah. And is like, can I buy that doodad? Like Jeff How Bezos walks in into your here? bookstore. Like you're like, oh, I know who you are. <laughs> yeah. All right, Jenny. So uh, at the end of every episode, we look back on theme or a lesson, something we took from the rewatch or the original. Think about how it manifested itself in our lives or how it resonated with us. We call it our why. It's designed to finish the sentence. Gen X, this is why. Jenny, what is your why for this? First of all, did you remember this episode? No. Some of our memes did. They remember. Well, I, did, I remember pieces of it. Like, I remember the general idea that, like, Charles made the table. But I didn't remember the okay. details of the story. Because some of our memes remembered and told the tale of being fooled by, okay, I'm sitting down to watch a Little House, and then there's a modern truck. Yeah, that had to really confuse people. They probably mm-hmm. thought they were watching the Dukes of Hazard. True, true. Um, so what's your why? This is why we thought like we were all gonna like get a tingly arm and die when we were sixty. <laughs> like they just portrayed like sixty and fifty as like ancient. Like you were just oh, like yeah. at the end of your life. Which I don't know. We talked you about like expectancy. Were then. And but it wasn't that dramatic. Like people still regularly lived into their seventies and eighties. This mm, wasn't like this I wasn't like the year up. one thousand. I'm gonna look this up. We talked about life expectancy numbers also, though. In 1880s. Because they mix in infant death. So you have to take, you have to take the, (laughs) Do you see my face? Yeah. 41? No, that's impossible. What? It hasn't doubled since in 100 years. The average lifespan. What? This is bullshit. It can't be 41. You have to look at the, at the data with, infant death removed from it because that skews the data because so many so many kids died in childbirth i don't know guys according to my research it's like don't listen to amy this is not good to you i feel like life expectancy so right now it's 78 so okay so in 1865 it says 35 that's probably because we were shooting each other in the streets Actually, it was we're pretty, not though. now. Let this... All right, fair. That's why it's gone down again. It's actually ticked down. 
Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised. Slightly from 2015. Mm -hmm. Um, No, it was pretty bad. Uh, From birth. No, see, it's from birth, though. So, like, so in the 1850s, it was like 41. That's what I'm saying. But, like, if it's from birth, you have to pull out the data. You have to take infant death, infant mortality rates out because it's. Yeah, I'm not doing that. Not doing that. All right. Okay. Okay. Forget it. Let's not talk about this anymore. All right. So, my, can I do my why? Sure, I guess, if we have to. My why is this is why Gen Xers are such better parents because. We see our kids as the best of us, not just accessories or staff. (laughs) And I feel like other generations did. Guys, watch Mad Men, if you don't believe me. Watch Mad Men, although many of you probably remember being raised this way if you were born in the 60s. You know, just you were just there to, like, make Don Draper martinis. Oh, Don Draper. Um, I mean, if to, your kids are staff, inhale, but, and to inhale Betty Draper secondhand smoke at lunch. I mean, if your kids are staff, aim, they're getting fired. My kids are terrible staff members. <laughs> I'm paying them way more than they're doing. <laughs> All right, Jane, why don't you tell everyone what's coming up next? Next episode is Uncle Jed, episode 15. Oh, boy. Carolyn and Charles are about to adopt James and Cassandra, but their Uncle Jed comes forward demanding custody of Cooper children. Are you fucking kidding me? We're just recycling. Recycling the plots at this point. No, but like, are you fucking kidding me that this guy's back? I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Um, Guys, if you haven't already, go back and watch Stone Soup. Where Laura is once again packed in ice. We need like a tally for who's packed in ice. <laughs> maybe we should get that going on the maybe bees. Because I'm I'm thinking we're only one or two episodes away from Manly being paralyzed and does I'm he get packed in ice? ice. I'm you sure know. that was their go to move. That was their go to move. They didn't have aspirin or ibuprofen, so they that's the only way they could bring down a fever. They did not. That's true. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening. Again, if you haven't already, check us out on Patreon. We're doing My So-Called Life. So in September, you'll have season one, episode two of that, and season one, episode two of Rock of Love, baby. Rock of Love, which is just a glorious dumpster fire. I love it so much. So uh, check us out there, and also smash that subscribe button. Okay. Oh, God, I can't even say it with a straight (laughs) face. So gross. <laughs> Just subscribe, guys, and leave us a review if you can. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, and we'll see you soon.